Can we? Okay. We all, uh, we all, all, all the mics work. Um, my, mine works, obviously. Mine? No. This one here. On. Try again, try again. It's okay. One, two, three. Works. Cool. Test. Yep, mine works too. Check one, two. One, two, one, two. I, yep, this sounds like it works. Perfect. Okay, great. And we're all set. So today, what we're having here is the, what, we, what we call the PHP Fig panel. And uh, the purpose of this panel is we have these fine gentlemen here to talk about what PHP Fig is, uh, what they do, uh, and of course, uh, during the talk and after it, uh, you're free to ask them questions about stuff that you always wanted to know about uh, PHP Fig. Um, a quick introduction to the guests here. You already uh, met some of them uh, during the talks today. Uh, starting from me on, uh, sitting next to me is Mr. Alexander Makarov, uh, Bo Simonsen, and Ian Littman. Uh, so if you want, Since you have, uh, you might have been already introduced as speakers, but it will be great if you introduce yourself as what you do in the PHP Fig and uh, like a quick words, whatever you want to add to, to this. Okay, um, so I'm representing the E framework in the PHP Fig, and I, I was also part of the working group for PSR 12, that is the updated coding standard. Well, it took some time, but it's now accepted. and. Also, I'm participating in uh, setting up the, well, processes, but not as much as other guys. I'm more into technical stuff. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, I'm on the core committee. Uh, our responsibility is uh, approving and sort of shepherding the different PSRs that are coming through. Um, we have the final say on votes for what will be brought up for acceptance, and then, act or, and then actually accepting the PSRs. Thank you, Bo. And I am one of the three secretaries on the FIG, uh, just making sure that uh, votes start and, and procedures are generally followed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then I'm going to start with the stupid questions first. <laughs> um, not that the other the ones are going to be any smarter, but uh, we, we keep saying PHP FIG. Can you please disambiguate this, uh, this uh, abbreviate this for us? What does it PHP FIG stand for? Yeah, it stands for the Framework Interoperability Group. Framework Interoperability Group, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's the G. Perfect. So uh, can you describe, any of you, whoever feels like, can you describe the PHP FIG organization with just like several sentences or something? Or how, however, okay. uh, as much so as you want. I'll try. So the PHP FIG changed over time. Originally, it was, uh, as the abbreviation said, Framework Interoperability Group. So their, um, the goal was to introduce some standards so the framework components could be inter-exchanged. That's the first pur purpose. And the second, that we can uh, combine our efforts and develop like perfect components uh, that this could be used by any framework. So that was original purpose. Then it started to evolve a bit and introduce standards that are not particularly about the frameworks. So these about uh, the community, about the coding standards, about the interfaces for that are not really strictly for the frameworks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Uh, it makes me understand more and more about the PHP fake, more than I knew before the panel, definitely. And um, then you mentioned it uh, went uh, outside the need uh, that concerns framework particular, it grew into something bigger. So where, where, the need, where did the need come from? How did this evolution got started? Uh, uh, Bo, would you like to explain that? Yeah, as I understand it, the, the, the very first uh, FIG proposal was PSR0, and that was geared toward auto-loading. Uh, but later, uh, we had some other, uh, FIG had other ideas early on. Um, and other things that were termed interoperability related uh, were things like some of the coding standard stuff, not the style guide necessarily, uh, because the style guide, tab spaces, all of that nonsense was not considered necessarily interoperability related, but it was still something that FIG wanted to do um, because 
you know, as people were starting to collaborate and cross-pollinate between different frameworks, it does make more sense for people to standardize at least somewhat on code, code style, so that you could actually go in and, and not feel like you have to reconfigure your editor just to start working on a new project. So th those were things that weren't necessarily interoperable, like technically, uh, but those were more community-oriented, people-oriented, where you want to start having other people contribute into your, your project. So that it still was sort of interoperability, but not really yet code, if that makes sense. Okay, I think it does. Uh, I'll, I'll take the, I'll, I'll pass the ball to the audience now, and now I'll ask for some hands to be raised. How many of you uh, are actually in your organization or in your personal work as a freelancer, maybe? How many of you use coding standards in general? Okay, and how many of you, uh, stick to PSR2, for example. Okay, that's a decent number of people. Uh, to be honest, uh, we, I work at SiteGround. In our organization, it took us some time to start doing this. And uh, the, the deal, the, the, the main reason to start doing this is what, when the team of uh, engineers uh, became a two-digit number. <laughs> because at some point, Everybody was writing their own uh, acceptable, visually uh, okay for him standard of, of code. And it was not generally okay for the others. So we have to do something. And then this is when we picked up PSR 2 mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to her too. Uh, but um, how, would you, how would you advise, for, uh, Ian, can you, can you make like a ad, like an advertisement to an organization on why should they choose to follow uh, a coding standard? Sure. At, at the end of the day, you have to make decisions on, for example, a coding standard or uh, say what, what to call methods on your logger or what to um, call methods on caching or event broadcasting or, any, or maybe an, an HTTP client. And it, you can either argue about those decisions back and forth, and uh, somebody over on one side says, oh, well, it's, uh, let's do uh, three spaces or two spaces. Two spaces is the best because JavaScript, uh, or three spaces is the best because that's how uh, I saw it in, um, in some other framework. Instead, you can look at the uh, recommendations provided by FIG and say, well, these particular recommendations are the result of people going back and forth, trying to find some common ground, and when you have decisions made for you, it's kind of a similar effect to having the actual code side of things built for you with either a library or a framework. It's one less decision that you have to make, and as a result, you can focus on things that make your application and your product actually unique in value creating. Thank you. Well, probably many of the people wonder, uh, including me, how do these standards start? Where the whole thing comes from? What is the, you know, let's say, the, the, the genesis of a standard? How do they get proposed? How do they get to the committee at all? Yeah, so that's, that's all changed quite a bit recently. Um, there's, a, there's a brand new workflow, and I'll be quite honest, I have to refer to it anytime. <laughs> um, anytime I actually want to figure out what the next step is or whatever. Um, but in general, the, the way that things have changed now is that rather than FIG as a whole coming together to come up with a new PSR, um, instead a working group is created for a specific um, thing. So for example, um, the, with the event listener stuff that just went through, uh, that was actually created as a working group. The working group built their proposal and then um, the, the core committee had to vote to put it up for review. And then once everybody had, uh, the, the correct people to vote on it had voted on it as, as review completed, uh, then the core committee votes on whether or not to accept it. So then there's, there's a, a review stage, there's the acceptance stage, there's at least one more, if I can't remember what it is. But the, these steps are well defined. It's a lot more complicated now than it used to be. Um, but for everything, that's kind of what we have the secretaries for to make sure that the, the 
proposals are going through the process the way that they're supposed to. But again, even the secretaries don't necessarily have to know the process, they just refer to it once, um, once a project gets into a certain stage. So if somebody wants to propose something for FIG, uh, like in the talk that I gave earlier, some, in, that was a much longer time ago, but somebody proposes it, and then FIG determines whether or not there are enough people interested in it to start working on it by creating a working group. So if somebody has something that they're interested in that they think would be good for framework interoperability, uh, they can propose it on the mailing list, get some feedback on it, and then learn the bylaws to figure out what they need in order to start a working group and uh, kind of kick off the process from there. Thank you. So uh, the way I get it, secretaries in figure something like QAs. They make sure everything goes by the book, by the process, and uh, the, the, the main rules are not broken or something like it. Yes, and uh, for example, we have actually a couple of votes starting on Monday for uh, versioning the interfaces uh, involved with uh, PSRs, for example, the uh, caching PSR, to kind of catch up with the newer enhancements that are available in, uh, in PHP 7.2 and above in particular. And uh, so we'll have, I believe, two votes for that because uh, actually different committees have to vote since this is a uh, bylaws change. And uh, that vote f will run for two weeks and I'll actually be the one to keep track of um, whether the correct people are voting and uh, then closing out the vote uh, in just a little over two weeks. So you mentioned votes. Uh, is it like, um, is there like a rule, like a, a majority of some number of people that have to vote or I mean, how, how does he, how do you determine that a certain proposal got the right number of votes, the, the enough sufficient number of votes to, to be passed forward? So you have uh, both quorum and, uh, so you have a minimum number of uh, participants voting as well as uh, rules on how many votes for versus against. And also um, different votes involve different parts of FIG. Uh, some votes are just for the core committee, some votes are for the work group, working group, uh, some votes include the member project leads. Um, so again, the, the I don't remember exactly the, the breakdown. I, I think that I have to vote in both of the votes that are coming up, um, but not everybody has to. So you kind of have to pay attention. As the vote is announced, it'll usually say who gets to vote in it. Okay. So is, there's like quotas for the different uh, sections of the fake post, right. the ones that propose the, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Well, we're uh, kind of uh, following the life cycle of a, of, a, of a PSR right now, gradually getting it to the hopefully successful end of some mm -hmm. proposal or maybe uh, a decline. Uh, say if a uh, given, given proposal is accepted and it has to become a standard, it gets all the votes it needs, then how do you proceed? How do you uh, proceed with, uh, for example, if it's a typical fake thing for uh, having to do with frameworks interoperability, uh, how do you proceed with getting the major frameworks accept this thing? Usually the frameworks are involved uh, at least to some extent in building out the specification to start with. So they have some skin in the game. They have uh, either given a thumbs up, uh, they may be on the, um, that particular working group to, for example, design an interface that they either basically are already implementing in their framework or can do so in the next minor or major release. So the expectation there is that if you participated in, um, in the formation of APSR, then you'll do the legwork on the framework side to make sure that that gets implemented uh, once the, the uh, recommendation goes into effect and gets accepted. Uh, that said, uh, each PSR is uh, very much an opt-in thing and frameworks can, if they want, cherry pick some standards and leave others as is. And this is partially because while the FIG is the de facto standards group, this is not Python, it's not core to the language itself, uh, what these interfaces and uh, implementation details are. 
Thank you. Uh, what, what I forgot to say to the audience, please excuse me because I started, this is my own query on what's in interesting to myself, <laughs> quite uh, uh, egoistically. Uh, I, was, I was about to say, if any of you have uh, something that you are particularly interested in on the topic we're discussing, uh, uh, we, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers, but uh, this is not a, a regular session, so uh, hands up in the air are welcome at any time, and our assistants are going to bring you the microphone, so feel free to ask questions, to raise hands at any time, if you guys feel like it, of, of course. Uh, it will be interesting to have uh, all the audience involved in this panel. So if anything comes up right now, feel free to ask. I, I see a hand up there, second row. Yeah. Given that uh, PHP now has, uh, has types and uh, people want to, uh, want to use types in their applications, uh, what are the plans for the existing PSRs uh, s some of them uh, don't have uh, time hints, and uh, if uh, they do get type hints, this will be a breaking change. So uh, I don't know if semantic versioning uh, um, will, uh, will fix this, maybe not. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, do you have plans for the process, uh, like a process on uh, how the PSRs will get, uh, will evolve? So as a matter of fact, that, uh, that exact question is what we're trying to address with the vote coming on Monday with uh, versioning PSRs such that the interface uh, will have a uh, minor revision that, um, that you can implement that requires PHP 7.2 because in PHP 7.2 you get covariance and contravariance in your parameter types and returns. So that means that an interface can have specific uh, parameters, whereas the implementation can accept parameters that are wider than that. And in the opposite direction, a, an implementation can have a specific return. And if the interface leaves off that return, then uh, that uh, variance is still valid. So by having, by having that approach and taking advantage of uh, that, that we got in PHP 7.2, which uh, very shortly will be uh, in security fixes only, so we feel that it's uh, safe to start pushing uh, PSRs up to the level of requiring uh, 7.2 or for uh, newer versions, we can address by First, a minor release of the PSR to get half of that, uh, or that implementation rather, or the interface rather, to get half of that equation uh, bumped up, and then uh, do a major uh, release of uh, that specification package to get the other half of the equation. Uh, we'll be able to get uh, implementing libraries and then uh, consumers of those libraries to push toward types in, uh, in how they interact with these PSRs. For more information on that, you can look at our FIG blog and uh, that links to Let's see here. There, there's a uh, there's a PR open actually on the PHP Fig repo that goes into detail on uh, the bylaw change that will allow us to to version these interfaces. And there's also a mailing list thread that uh, I believe is linked from the uh, blog post on the phpfig.org website uh, that explains it better than um, than I can as uh, I was not completely in the middle of uh, working on that versioning strategy. Uh, one of the other uh, secretaries, uh, Alessandro Lai, was. Actually, this is, this is probably a good time to point out that this is why we have to do two votes coming up, because for the entire existence of PHP FIG, uh, one of the main rules was that once a PSR is created, it cannot be edited, cannot be changed except for cosmetic changes to documentation. Um, the PSRs are not 
infallible, um, and they don't get to evolve with the language. So uh, PSR0, for instance, um, we, we superseded PSR0 with PSR4. Um, with PSR2, that did not take into account a bunch of the new language changes either. Um, and that was created, you know, 10 years ago, five, however long ago that was. Um, and that's what <coughs> PSR12 was for, is to enhance PSR2 to include some of the new styling for some of the new pieces. So the way that we've sort of extended things in the past is by creating a new PSR. Um, but we don't necessarily want to do that in every case. Um, especially for things like uh, changing new versions to account for new language, things like putting type hints or uh, return types. So that's why we are actually creating a, a bylaw change that will allow us to evolve the PSRs over time. Uh, but this particular bylaw is very specific in that it only handles these, PS, uh, these PHP 7.2 changes. Um, so once we get to the case where we have like multiple uh, return types, I don't exactly know if this is going to allow us to make that change, but it might be something similar to what we have to do now, where we, it's actually going to re require a bylaw change in order to do that. It also depends on whether or not it even makes sense for any of the existing PSRs to need to actually have uh, multiple return types. So it sort of depends in those cases, and what we could do is look at the actual PSRs themselves and see how many of them are using the, uh, I guess it's the, is it, what's the PHP doc PSR? Uh, that five. That's five. five, yes. Yeah, PSR 5 is the PHP doc compatible PSR that has been around for a long time. It hasn't been done yet. But we do use those conventions in writing the PSRs. So it's not actually code level. It's in the you know, little at return. Uh, we could look to see how many of those actually support things like at return mixed colon null. And that mm -hmm. would tell us which ones actually could potentially be impacted. But I don't know if that's actually the case right now. I haven't done any looking on that. So I, I don't know if that answers that question a little more specifically for that. Um, but yeah, that's why we're doing two, P, uh, two votes right now. Anyone feel like asking something else? All right, hands there. Uh, I'm curious to know if you have any specific relationship with the people behind the PHP Z engine, because uh, as PHP is getting more and more expressive, uh, maybe some part between the fig and what could land in PHP may overlap. By people uh, who maintain the Z engine, you mean the Dmitry Stogov and Nikita Popov? Uh, yeah, Mostly. the people developing uh, the PHP, yeah. Okay, PHP the team. whole uh, core PHP team, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, there is no particular relations with the PHP core team between the PIG and the, the core PHP team, so we're dealing mostly with uh, what we have in changes. We're not really forcing any changes in the core. Well, at least not as part of the PHP PIG. We do communicate individually, but that's different. And we do watch the RFC process uh, as we get additional language features, and uh, those come into play in terms of what we can do with PSRs and the timing of those. For example, uh, the uh, PSR 14 event uh, interface actually requires an explicit object type hint, which wasn't available until PHP 7.2. Union types, which will be available in PHP 8, are going to open up uh, the potential for maybe a uh, cleaner approach to going from implementing kind of a draft of a particular recommendation to implementing the final version. So while we're not necessarily pushing the language from our side, we're paying a, a fair amount of attention to uh, where it's going and, and cheering on cases where uh, it allows us to uh, provide implementations that are, or, or encourage implementations that are uh, better for interoperability. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, if nobody has a question in mind, I would like to ask one. Uh, of course, you can you can interrupt any any time. As I said, uh, I'm, I'll be trying to, to to be looking out for hands and uh, the guys with the microphones. Also, please.
do interrupt me if someone is uh, uh, raising their hand and want to ask a question. Um, I'm going to ask a, a strange question. Maybe uh, you might consider me a troll, but um, <laughs> mm -hmm. can you please uh, mention some of the most loved and most hated proposals if you have something heavy in mind, of course. The most loved one is the hearts, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got to love PSR eight. Yeah. Um, there have definitely been uh, some uh, more controversial uh, PSRs. In fact, um, fourteen. Uh, the, the event interface uh, had a fair amount of back and forth, and some piece of the uh, controversialness or lack thereof can be seen in how long a PSR takes to actually make it through the process. Uh, and some of that uh, length of time is due to the fact that nobody's really being paid to, to do fig things, and so everybody is contributing to these recommendations as time is available. So you end up with a uh, more overarching, complex um, specification like PSR 12, and uh, that was kind of on the table there for a few years, and only recently made it across the finish line, uh, uh, I believe a couple of months ago now. I'd say probably PSR 2 has been pretty controversial, uh, mostly just because 50% of the people hate spaces. So <laughs> oh, yeah. um, a lot of people just... It's always a 50-50 yeah, thing. There. So, I mean, at least half the developer population doesn't like PSR 2 just for that reason. Um, PSR 7's actually been relatively controversial. Um, some of the bigger uh, framework players aren't actually a part of FIG anymore. Um, so Symphony and Laravel are no longer, uh, they don't think they have any membership. I think they both quit. Um, and a big part of that is because of a lot of reasons, but PSR 7 is incompatible with Symphony, uh, Symphony's HTTP foundation. Um, and Laravel is based on Symphony's HTTP foundation. So that's been uh, somewhat controversial as trying to get people to adopt it when some sort of the big players in the framework space aren't even playing with it. Um, I mean, there's a whole ecosystem around PSR 7. I, I talked about that today. It's like, it's the whole thing that, you know, the, the impact of that is a lot less because Symphony's not involved and Symphony isn't going to take that on. Um, and, the, you know, there were actual problems with PSR 7 that would be great for us to be able to fix uh, with, with future versions. Um, so if we can find a new way to sort of evolve PSR 7 the same way, maybe we can fix some of the issues. Um, but yeah, so I would, I would probably say PSR 2 and PSR 7 are actually pretty, pretty controversial, really. Okay. As for non-controversial ones, I could mention the PSR 0 and PSR 4, and these were, I think these were never questioned at all. And these changed a lot in the PHP world. Yeah, you could definitely feel the impact of those ones. Uh, uh, what was the one about the Huggables? Uh, and I saw these t-shirts some yep. time ago. It's PSR 8. PSR 8, okay. Hugs. Yeah. That started as a joke, but yeah, it, it, it got some adoption. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right then. Well, you said PSR 2 would be uh, one of the most controversial one because of course, the, the, not only the, the spaces versus tabs kind of. Uh, it was controversial. Uh, sorry? It was controversial. Yeah, I, now yeah. now it, it is not because people got used to spaces. Yes, they got used to spaces, but I, I'm just uh, going to throw in a little hint to those of you who work in organizations that do not adopt it. And uh, I'm going to tell you my very, very quick personal story of fighting my way into getting PSR <laughs> mm -hmm. into our code base. Uh, and, uh, it's, you're definitely going to take a, a lot of hits, a lot of uh, accusations from people. They're not going to talk with you for, for a while probably afterwards, but then eventually everybody gets used to this. And the only way to enforce it for me was to literally put it in a pre-receive hook in Git. Uh, it was, it, I tried with initially with uh, uh, just advising people to have their own uh, pre-commit hooks that will just do analysis. I used PHP MD. Uh, uh, of course, you don't have to. 
if you're working on a legacy code base and uh, say PSR2 is not totally, totally compatible with what you're doing, for, for example, we, had, we still have some legacy code in SiteGround which was based on Zen Framework 1. And you have the namespaces with the, the underscores, mm -hmm. the, the non-namespacing kind of naming of, uh, mm -hmm. of classes and stuff. This is not PSR2 compatible. But you can always say, okay, we have this huge uh, amount of controllers there that are going to remain like they are because we're not going to use them a lot more. We're going to move to Symfony, but still we don't want to enforce this. Uh, you can always... Uh, add exceptions to an XML that just says it's very easy to, to make your own uh, XML rule set. You just say this is going to be PSR2, but without this and this and this, which is very easy. It, it took me like five minutes to put up this. And as I said, initially I started uh, uh, asking people to have it as a pre-commit hook. This way, every time they try to make a commit that would break the PSR, they will get a message back that uh, they should correct their own code. But how did you enforce installing the hooks? Exactly, Didn't this is the problem. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. One of the one of the techniques was uh, to put it in uh, in composer JSON as uh, uh, as the, when you can specify stuff that gets executed automatically when you run composer install, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, their own uh, commit hook gets. Uh, suppressed and replaced by, <laughs> by the and stuff there. Of course, this does not work universally. And plus, you can always delete it afterwards and decide not to use it. Plus, you can force it, which would totally override the, the, the pre-commit hook. Uh, but that's not the point. Eventually, we got to a point that we had to put it as a pre-receive hook, period, and just not accept commits that are not compatible. We would only run checks on the new code that's being committed. Uh, that's not really hard to do. The main point is that at some point we had to do a big cleaning of the mm -hmm. code, and now it gets to the ugly part. Uh, when you do this, we call it the, the big PSR2 sweeping, um, because it would pretty much, you would, you would run the, the beautifier, uh, the, the, the PHP, uh, what was it, the PHP? PHP CBF. Yeah, you run the PHP yeah. CBF over a huge project, you end up with huge amount of files changed. And you have to do this crazy commit that basically uh, affects everything. Mm -hmm. And y if you are me, I was the person who had to do this, you get hated for a lot of months <laughs> afterwards because people have to rebase their pre-PSR projects on the current master, <laughs> which has changed a lot. Oh, yeah, um, another side effect is that you are uh, appearing as owner Yes. Of all the code. Yes. So and everyone I, blames you. I get blamed for everything that cannot bubble up to something recent. Uh, so basically, <laughs> yeah, uh, I take all the blame in my organization for this. But I, uh, I can assure that this is worth the effort. I'm, I'm personally very happy about doing this. Uh, and my life has been easier since then. Uh, reading, readability of the code we produce is easier. Uh, having new developers start from there. You have accepted coding standard, that's the way we do it, is uh, a thing that is definitely to work this effort. If any of you has stories to share about enforcing this or failed to enforce this, <laughs> I think it will be fun to share. Any of the audience, did you, did you try enforcing PSR in your organizations? And. Okay. Well, we included it in the CI, so you cannot uh, so your pipeline fails if there's a problem. So this enforces it and you cannot push to your branch or merge into master if your code standard isn't applied. So pushing it in the CI is a good choice, I think. Yeah, that's a good way. And also there, there is currently a project uh, that is providing continuous integration for uh, GitHub. You can install in a single click that's called uh, Style CI and it reformats the code automatically. So it doesn't mind if you're uh, pushing incorrectly formatted code, it just reformats it. Oh, on the fly? Yeah. Yep. Oh. yeah. Well, it's good, but I think it doesn't provide the, the learning experience. No, it doesn't. So in StyleCI, uh, so one of the projects that I helped maintain joined in, uh, we have StyleCI installed at this point. We may need to do a few tweaks to its configuration to match PSR 12, but we have it configured to, um, to fail the build, but if you click into the details on the failed uh, 
CI testing side of things, you can actually see the changes that Style CI suggests in order to bring the uh, application into line. And that's on uh, whatever files and lines. It's actually on a per file basis that Style CI checks to see whether that code conforms to style. Now it's not going to check to see whether, for example, you type hinted against a uh, logger interface rather than a concrete version of monolog. But if you're looking at styling in particular, uh, style CI is quite useful and you can configure it either to make the changes itself or to merely suggest them. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Proposals? We have a gentleman there on the second row. Can you please raise your hand again so that the, the mic here can see? Okay. Uh, I have a question. It's not about the PSR2, actually. It was, uh, it's about uh, PSR7. You said that um, you have some problems that you want to, to fix in, uh, in the future. Can you elaborate more, and more on this? What are the problems you're trying to solve and why? Yeah, so with PSR7, one of the controversial things was immutability. Uh, I don't necessarily think we need to change immutability, but we also have streams, and streams are sort of inherently mutable. Um, so what you end up with if you're passing around these request and response objects with a stream, if you change the stream, you are actually changing the other copies of the object. So that isn't, that isn't true for the other methods. Like if you change, change a status method on a response from 200 to 404, it actually creates a new instance of the response object with 404. Um, if you start reading or start writing to that stream, you would actually be impacting the original 200 response as well. So there, there, there are some things that we could potentially do to fix that or to make it more explicit and clear what, what needs to happen there. Um, but they're sort of edge case things that when you run into them, they're a big pain. Uh, but I don't think they're necessarily things that people would normally run into unless you're trying to do some really complicated things with middleware. Um, maybe the framework needs to do some special things, things like that. I think a lot of it is circumvented a bit by PSR 17 with the factories because now it's easier than it was before to create a new stream. So if I create a new instance of a response object um, from a, a, a previous response object, it's easier for me to then give it a new stream so it no longer talks to the old stream. Um, so it's, it's, we've sort of already fixed that in a sense, but if you're not aware of those sorts of pitfalls, uh, you could definitely walk into some troubles. So I, it's that kind of thing that it was really hard to find in the discovery and planning phase, even though it took two years. Um, it took people actually going into this and working in PSR 7 related code to sort of find some like edge case things like that. Uh, I think the other thing is possibly reading PHP standard in. It's another thing that isn't handled very well within PSR 7 itself, uh, where that can only be read once. So if you do that somehow in a PSR7 uh, request object, for example, and you replace that stream later somehow, you're never gonna be able to get standard in again. Um, so there's, there's edge cases um, that are, I think they're pretty well documented now, um, at least in PSR7's you know, issue log of things that people don't like PSR7 for, but they're very edge case. Um, it's not like it, you're gonna run into it just by using you know, Guzzle with PSR7. Um, it's gonna be something that someday we'll fix, hopefully, um, so that we don't have to worry about those weird little edge cases anymore. Thanks. Actually, it's a big question if the immutability and the streams should be fixed. Yes. Yeah. And because if you try to do immutability on uh, streams as, as they're built out right now, with the ability that we have to work with streams in PHP core right now, uh, then there may be a uh, memory usage or performance trade-off to do that. Um, doing the memory and performance trade-off 
on smaller fields like headers and HTTP status, where you're having to call with and create a uh, clone of the request or response every time you modify an attribute. It's not such a big deal because of the internals of PHP and copy on write and, uh, and what have you. But when you're talking about a uh, request or response body that uh, may be uh, multiple megabytes in size or larger, or uh, may be uh, being generated on the fly, uh, you, you end up with uh, that trade-off being a lot more front and center. Thank you, Ian. I, uh, is there a hand there? Yeah, on the first row. Hi. Um, <clears throat> today we had the talk here on the conference about the asynchronous executions in uh, PHP. Um, should we expect uh, some PSR about that to appear soon? Because, uh, you know, today most of the big applications are uh, uh, microservices based architecture and uh, there's all, there are lots of calls that are going behind the scenes. Uh, for example, languages like Java and uh, Python, they support natively multi-threading and so on. PHP for now does not support natively multi-threading, but uh, there are frameworks out uh, in the wild that are supporting asynchronous execution. Should we expect, expect soon something in that direction to appear as PSR? to define that functionality. Do you mean event looping? Yeah, event looping, observables, promises. I think it's more part of the language than the part of the standards, the PSR ones. But the uh, group of the uh, HTTP standards is very useful for that purpose because uh, what the integrations with Swool framework, the Roadrunner framework do, they are generating the um, PSR uh, server request instance and require the PSR uh, server response instance in the end. So um, it helps to reuse everything that is, uh, well, regular PHP code except this event loop. So this helps, but I don't think the um, actual things for uh, promises, etc., do belong to the user land, actually. It's more of a PHP stuff, the RFC is not PSR. I, th I think that in the past there has been talk about, for example, a, a, a promise-based PSR. But I don't think it went anywhere. I know that AMPHP and React both are fake members or have been in the past. And that was one of the things that was brought up when they came on board, or that's why they came on board, to see if they could do something with that. So it, it's possible that we could have a promise-based PSR, but the fact that we haven't yet probably means that they're, they're happy being user land right now. Um, but, you know, for example, the uh, PSR 18 client, uh, there is, uh, React code, AMPHP code, and whatnot that is using the uh, PSR7 interfaces, like you mentioned, uh, but they can't necessarily use the, the client interface because the client interface returns a response. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't work well with uh, the way that most of the, the asynchronous applications work right now because they need to return a response or return something other than just the response right away. Um, so that, that could be something that if PHP gets promises or if PSR promise comes out sometime in the next, you know, 10 years or whatever, um, and we have PHP union types, response uh, union return types, we could maybe update PSR 18, for example, to return um, response interface or a promise. So it, it would have to be something like that in order to be able to um, sort of evolve some of the PSRs to also support um, uh, some asynchronous. I think generators are another way that, I think that's how AMPHP does their yeah. promises with generators. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it could be as simple as allowing um, the PSR 18 interface to return also an array 
we so may answer this question differently in a few years after, I don't know, either adoption or non-adoption of asynchronous PHP overall. Yeah, so yeah. asynchronous is, is really exciting right now, but there's a lot of stuff that, that relies on very specific user land code that's sort of proprietary in the sense that like even React and AM PHP code aren't compatible with each other. They, they, you, can, you can share the, the loop between the two, um, but the actual interfaces and everything that they're using are different, they're implemented differently. Um, so I think it'll be a little while before we actually get like standardization on that. And, and on top of that, while there are certain cases where you can adapt uh, AMP code to React or vice versa, you also have uh, the, I suppose, relatively new player, uh, Swool, who has done uh, major releases and, and breaking changes in their own implementation and interfaces in relatively recent history. So because you have uh, th you know, three implementations that are at least somewhat of a moving target, uh, with Swool potentially being uh, a more performant one because it's showing lo lower level primitives and that's actually implemented as a PHP extension rather than uh, sitting in user land on top of, say, libuv for the event loop. Uh, though, honestly, AMP is plenty fast. You, you end up, if you try to throw that into a standards recommendation process, um, you end up trying to hit a moving target, and particularly when the language itself uh, may get uh, more proper async primitives uh, built in, more than just uh, generators, more than just uh, the promises that you would see if you call, say, a guzzle send async. Uh, we may not be ready yet to try to standardize something that's still in a fair amount of flux. Okay. Thank you. And uh, can you say a few words about uh, PSR uh, 20? Um, before some time, mm, by the way, I'm checking from time to time mm, what's uh, going out as PSRs. Hmm. Um, I saw that uh, it will be a new coding standard. I think it was PSR 20. Um, not sure about 20. We just uh, accepted 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And over there. Um, thank you. I just want to forgive my level of, at the level of which I'm asking this question. Um, as a developer, at times you get, it's, it's, it's sometimes scary when there are so many changes and at times I get worried when I want to um, do a composer update because so many things, my, my code is de depending on so many other libraries that are depending on other libraries. And it gets worrisome at times. And many times, you just want to stick with what works. As against doing an update and some things will, you have to start chasing around with the test to, to know what's up. Um, are we going to ever get to a point where we have a much more higher level of stability? I don't know if I'm the only one in this category, but I'm just speaking for myself. Are we going to get to a point of standardization across, well, thanks to the, um, the PSR fig, that um, some of us will have, uh, will, will have much more peace of mind at times? That's the question. Well, ab abstraction-wise, the PSR are contributing a lot to overall stability of the PHP libraries, but the, there is basically no need and well, to change the interface, it's already set in stone in the, as the PSR standard. So that definitely contributes a lot to the stability. Uh, taller, uh, a bit later, a, a bit earlier, uh, uh, our friend here from the first row asked about uh, new PSRs, and this was uh, kind of uh, interlapping with a question that I was about to have to you guys. Can you bring out something new and shiny from the kitchen that's coming out <laughs> soon? Well, the, it's not new and shiny. It's just shiny. Okay, works. So that's PSR5 that is in, in the works for a long, long, long time. That's PHP Doc. And when it will be released, it will uh, significantly change the IDE's landscape. 
because it, it adds so many features for annotating things for doing the fancy documentation and also it will be reflected in the PHP documenter itself. So we'll be able to do much better documentation from uh, the code. Since you mentioned annotations, uh, we spoke earlier that uh, we mentioned Symfony and Laravel and know Symfony, uh, they use a lot of these annotations for, especially for entities and uh, defining, uh, binding them to, to database types and all that stuff. Uh, is it expected that uh, PSI PSR5 is going to be compatible with what they're doing right now? The way they use annotations and comments and... Yes. yes. Okay. Well, the, the way the annotations are used is uh, the standard one. So it, it's not going to change. It's, uh, the PSR5 is defined in the set of annotations that are uh, targeted at document and stuff. Okay. That, that's okay. not for the meta information that is read okay. runtime and then use some of I'm sorry, I misunderstood the concept. Okay, thank you. Well, we're, toward, uh, we're getting slowly towards the end of this panel. Uh, and if, if any of you would like to add up to questions or any of you would like to comment on something, be great. Unless uh, unless somebody has to add something, I would like to thank my guest. Oh, Ian, sorry. No problem. Uh, so, in any case where you see something that you have questions on, why uh, why Fig is going a certain way, or would like to weigh in, the mailing list is open. You can. Uh, drop a comment in there and be part of the conversation. In addition, uh, we have elections for uh, the uh, core committee as well as secretaries every so often. And uh, to be quite honest, the, uh, the level of uh, competitiveness for uh, each of those positions isn't all that high, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting up here. And uh, as such, there are ample opportunities for if you feel uh, strongly about participating in, uh, in this community in this way, there's nothing stopping you. Great, so anyone Bring can Bring in your ideas. <laughs> yeah. They are welcome. Yeah. And you don't have to be like voted in in order no. to participate. Like if you yes. join in the mailing list, if you get involved in one of the working groups on GitHub um, or however, they're, however each one is communicating, I think there's a Slack channel for some of the work groups. Like if a work group needs a Slack channel, the secretaries will set up a channel for that. Um, so yeah, it, you can be involved without being voted in, but they, it is good for people to know that that is a possibility as well. Like we're not, we're not really super special other than we said, I will do that if I get voted in and then you get voted in, so. <laughs> exactly. Great, thank you for this remark. Thank you to letting the audience know about actually how this process is not something uh, out of this world or anything. It's uh, <laughs> very, very acceptable, uh, accessible to, to anyone. Well, thank you all for participating in this panel and thanks to all our uh, audience attendees for have being here. Thank you for all your questions. I would like to make some remarks uh, before we go and head to the party, which is the obviously imminent future. Uh, of all of us here in this hall. Um, again, I would like to thank all the sponsors, all the volunteers, all the staff that were involved into uh, making this day happen and tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so uh, the doors tomorrow are going to open at nine o'clock. Have this in mind uh, for coming tomorrow morning. I would like to, uh, there, there's a party organized by SiteGround uh, in, in a little while, as I mentioned. I'd like to, mar to make a personal remark, uh, if I may, for a minute. Uh, today, I was Googling something up, uh, and I totally forgot the, 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 the importance of this day in modern European history. Today is November 9th, and it's 19, 9, it's 1219, which is exactly 30 years since the Berlin Wall came down which I would like uh, to, to make a reference to it because it's a special day for European history. It, it started a chain reaction that uh, uh, in this part of Europe especially that could not be changed, could not be stopped and nothing was like it was before. Thanks to this, thanks to these changes, we have events like this. Thanks to these changes, we have guests from all over visiting and we are able to participate in, in a community which is global and uh, 
you, it wouldn't be happening here in Sofia in the national powers of culture if this change did not bring uh, this wind of change in, in Europe. Uh, so uh, celebrate community, celebrate diversity, network with each other, and definitely when you head to this party over there organized by SiteGround, don't forget to say cheers to someone you don't know, to someone that you just met here in the conference because it's a perfect opportunity to make new friends. And thank you all. Thank you all again.